for next Wednesday for sure. But Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> of course, after church, if I can help get some stuff. Like I said, we're going we're gonna to try getting that... Um, that uh, Wow, the storage unit this coming week, but if not, I need help kind of putting Humpy Dumpter back here, back together again. That is my Sunday morning sermon. That's not going to help me tonight. There it is. Matthew chapter 6. As you know, there's 34 verses in Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to memorize them all tonight. Uh, but there's, there's um, as we go through Matthew chapter 6, we realize Matthew chapter 5 talks about this you know, having a spirit, you know, spirit, you know, being blessed, and we're blessed to bless. We kind of hit on that last week. This week is our focus on 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 doing things spiritually, having doing our focus on spiritual things. And it says in chapter six, verse one. <clears throat> Matthew chapter six, verse one. Let me at least shut up the machine going that I rarely listen to anyway. Take heed that ye do not uh, your alms before men, to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say to you, they have the reward. Verse number, verse number 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. Then look it down to number, verse number uh, 15. Sorry, verse number 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So he says it several times, don't do things, you know, in front of men, for lip service, for men to see how we are, because when they do that, he says, these people have the reward. They're doing it for show. They have a reward. I want to talk about, first of all, doing, doing things and the things of God for evil reasons. Now, evil is like this. You know, the Bible says God creates good and God creates evil. The Bible says in Isaiah that God creates evil. Calvinists love that verse because as all see God's the author of sin. God is originator of sin. Evil does not always mean sinful, wicked, it all, but it also means that it's not as good. It's, it's destructive, okay? God does no evil. God does no evil, okay? But we know that we see these people, they do things, and it's for a lackluster. They don't do it for the right reasons. They're not doing it for the glory of God. They're doing it for theirs. And they have the reward. But in so doing, they're destroying all their benefits that they do, and that they they're going to have in heaven. All the rewards, they're going to destroy all those things on earth because wood, hay, and stubble. They have the reward on earth; they're not getting it in heaven. And he says it. Don't he tells the disciple? He's telling the multitude here, the same multitude in Matthew chapter four, that's that where that he healed all manner of diseases. Chapter five, he sits on a mountain, and his disciples come up to him, and he teaches the people, right? This this, this huge multitude. And he's, he's preaching to them, he's telling them, take heed that you don't do these things. The people who are there following Jesus, the people there who are listening to Jesus, the people whose lives have been changed by Jesus, being in their lives, by Jesus healing their, their blindness and you know, their, you know, giving them vision and giving them ears to hear and be able to speak and, and for the leprosy to be cleansed and all manner of diseases, he's telling these people that had been with Jesus that are listening to Jesus' doctrine, don't be like that. Make sure you don't do this. It's very possible for us, believers today, to do things in the flesh. <gasps> no way! Sunday, I went soul winning in the flesh for the first five doors. I'm guilty of it. The first five doors. Stairs. Really? Who picked this street with stairs? And I went knocking the first door, and it was like, this lady is answering the door, and she's looking through the screen, and she tells me that her dad's a reverend, and I'm like, I can't stand it when they say that, because it means they're riding on mom and daddy's coattails, and they're not having the righteousness of Christ, or of their own, or of their parents. They're just like, really? And it is, the house smelled like cigarette smoke, and smelled like other kind of smoke that's not just cigarette smoke. Look, 
there's there's a difference between smoke and smoke smoke. And this other smoke smoke was making me feel very, very munchy. Okay? So all I can tell you is that I went to this house and I was not very positive with this house. And it just you could tell the house had just been like things are going on in the house that not not be. But there's evil reasons that I was at that door. And here I am trying to preach the gospel and I had evil reasons. The Bible tells us there's there's people here that in, in Matthew chapter six that they were doing it to be seen of men. Is it wrong to fast? No. Is it wrong to be seen? Is it wrong to to um, to give alms? Not at all. Giving you know you giving to the Lord is great. Someone told me the other day is like you know hey when I went to your church you didn't pass you didn't pass a basket. And I just want to know why was my money not good enough? And I'm like. No, there's a basket there if you want to give. If you don't want to give, great. Well, I don't know. I'm like, well, we don't expect anybody to give that doesn't want to give to the Lord. It's there. You know, if you wanted to give, you got to ask. We could have told you. But it's like, oh, I don't want to be seen with men. I'm like, all right. Well, they got all upset because we didn't pass an offering basket. I'm like, whatever. But some people, they do alms to be seen of men. They let you know about it, too. They let you know about all that they did. I was there's some churches you go to and they get up there and, on a Sunday night and they give a praise report for how many people they led to the Lord and they get up and they give a salvation, quick salvation story about how many people they led to the Lord and a story about how they got someone saved and it's good that they're leading people to the Lord but it's almost like this guy I talked to this one guy his name was uh, Doug no yeah it was Doug it's not this Doug it's a different Doug and this guy got up and he was like yeah, I almost didn't get a chance to give testimony tonight, but I went out before church and I led someone to the Lord at the gas station just so I could give a report. And I'm like, and there it goes. And it was like he was so interested about seeing someone saved, and it was not about it's that he wanted to do it not to get the person saved, not because he loves the Lord, but did it to be seen of men. And that's what he says here, to be seen of men. He says, those people are seen of men, they have the reward, and they do it for adoration. Some people are so self-centered, they do it for praise. Now, adoration is different than praise. Okay, there's a difference. Adoration is like, yeah, man, I'm the best out there. Oh, yeah. Look what I can do. But self-centered is that they have to be praised in order to keep on going. It's not the praise of saying, oh, what a wonderful person you are. It's like, hey, man, I really appreciate you doing it. Thank you for doing service. Thank you for doing it. Because if they don't get the attention, if they don't get the recognition, they stop doing it. Last week, I had a really good sales week. I mean, I shouldn't say really good. I had a better sales week than I've had in a while, and I was pretty excited about it. And they have a newsletter that the company prints out, and the company printed out, and it said, you know, it's the top reps. And I looked at my total of what I sold last week, and I'm looking at the newsletter, and I should have been, like, on the top 15. I should have been up there, and, you know, instead of the third page, I should have been in the top. I'm like, what in the world? And it kind of got me frustrated because I just wanted a little bit of recognition. I just wanted someone to come along and pat me in the back and say, you're doing a great job. I'm like, really? And I was like, how childish of me. I'm like, why am I such in the flesh this past couple days? And I realized I hasn't had pizza in a while. So it was like, fix that. But it was so self-centered. It was so like, really? But people do that. Well, I, don't, I helped out cleaning the church. No one told me, thank you. Pastor didn't put my name in the bulletin. We literally had that in New York. And it wasn't. And we also had that in Florida, in our church plant in Florida. It was literally like if we didn't give public recognition, people flipped out. One guy actually left the church because we didn't recognize him publicly. And it's not that they have it's not that they're so pumping themselves up with pride, is they have to be patted in the back. They have to be recognized. They have to be they have to be affirmed every week. And I'm like, at some point, I'm like, look, I am not affirming you every week. Either you are confirmed in Jesus Christ, you're accepting the beloved. And that needs to be good enough for you because I'm not always going to drop your name from the pulpit. That's just going to stop. And the guy got mad and left. But also, their, their spirituality is defrauded. The Bible calls them hypocrites. The Bible calls them hypocrites because they appeared to be one thing and they did the total opposite. So there's people that are doing, like going soul winning, but they're doing it with the wrong motives. They're doing it with, for, for self-adoration, to be seen of men. They're doing it to be self-centered in their praise about what they think about themselves, and their spirituality is defrauded. And you're like, wow, they're not as spiritual as I thought they were. Or wow, you can see right through them and say, what a fraud. What if? And you can tell it too, because when they're put to the fire, they melt. When they're put to the test, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're, the wind drives them away. They're tossed with every woman doctrine, and they're gone. 
They're gone in the wind. Well, what happened? Their spirituality was defrauded. I'm not saying they never walked with God. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, in that moment of their time, their spirituality is defrauded because their spirituality is tied to what they do and what, they, and what they're seen of men. And if they're not seen of men, if they're not recognized, if they're living opposite of what they're doing, hey, Sunday I was, I was defrauded. Sunday, going out soul winning, I was defrauded. And it took me about five or six hours before I caught on to it. I was like, oh, okay, i got to stop. And I literally stopped, and I literally took, a, took 35 seconds to a minute, and just took a deep breath, and I was like, okay, Lord, you got to forgive me for doing this in the flesh. Please help me. I need to get out of the flesh and get in the Spirit. Lord, please help me to surrender to the Spirit right now and crucify the flesh in my mind and stop complaining about walking up a small hill to carry a, you know, a New Testament and some tracks to a door when you carried my cross of Calvary's hill. So pardon me for being selfish. Lord, please forgive me for being selfish. And in my mind, from that on, I felt okay. I mean, still walking back, my legs were hurting, and my body was aching, and I overdid it the, the week before. But I was like, you know what? I don't want my spirituality to be brought I'm not boasting myself about how I came to recognize it. I'm saying that's what we need to do, is recognize that we're not doing what we say we're hypocrites. I'm here to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Why is your stare so lopsided? <laughs> What is wrong with you? <laughs> but you also, not only do you see people doing it for earthly reasons, but you also see people serving God for earthly cares. They're doing it for earthly cares. You know pastors, missionaries, evangelists, church members, you know people do things out of earthly care. Sometimes we serve God because we want God to give us a blessing for food, raiment, or clothing. You know, food, raiment, food, raiment, or lodging, or hair on top of our head if it's possible. At this point, Josh, I say we give up. But um, <laughs> I'm right there with you. I'm like, hey, you know, what's up with that? You know, my, both, my, my, hairline has, my hairline has receded. It's given up. It's retreating. And I don't know what to do about it. But uh, some people worry about, they, some, they, sometimes the only reason why people will go out soul winning is because they want God to bless them. Or sometimes people only tithe. It's because they want to force God, pigeonhole God into, into blessing them. Okay, God, it's this refrigerator. All right, God, I'm going to go get a styrofoam chest, but you better bless me. <laughs> well, that's, that's, not, that's not, you may do it for obedience, but guess what? What I ain't stubble. It's not going to get your rewards. But some people only serve God for earthly cares. Some pastors won't get up and preach the whole counsel of God, won't get up, and they've studied out. Let's say a little, let's pick a hobby horse topic we talk about. Let's talk about the, you know, spiritual Israel. They've studied it out. They've come to realize that, hey, we are the children of Abraham through Christ. We are spiritually, spiritual, we are a spiritual Israel. And those promises are to us by Christ. But they won't get up and preach it. They'll dance around the issue. They'll not head it straight on. And they'll, because they're afraid, because if they do, they'll get kicked out of the church. And when they come, they're like, you know what, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go that direction. Or, hey, what about the post-trib rapture? You come out openly and preach and preach, you know, preach the post trib rapture. It's almost like if you want to do that and keep your church, you've got to be like, why? I'm studying it up. You can show me, show me otherwise, but I'm not sure. And come across as the harmless ignorant, you know. And but they're but they're doing it in such a way like I'm afraid to touch a subject. Or hey, preaching on the inspiration of the Bible, or preaching on salvation by grace through faith without repentance, you know, repentance of sins necessary. Whatever we reprobate doctrine. Oh, good grief, the reprobate doctrine. Well, yeah, I'm in secret. I'll say it, but I can never see it from the pulpit. I'll never see it. Why not? We'll split my church. I don't know what I'll have to do. The church couldn't survive if I did. Well, you don't have much of a church if you can't preach with liberty. And how many pastors do that? How many pastors have that issue where they can't? I remember when I was in New York, and I started looking at this thing, and I started reading through the Bible, and I was like, guys, I don't believe in the pre-trib rapture anymore. I said, this is what the Bible is. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't wholeheartedly agree with this, and this is what I believe. I do believe it's pre-wrath, but I was having trouble with the timing. I was having trouble with the timing because I didn't, I didn't have spiritual Israel down right. But I was having trouble with the timing. I'm like, look, I think we're going to get through this. I think we're going to go through some hard times. I think we're going to go through man's anger, man's wrath. I believe we're going to be here to the Antichrist. So I started preaching this in 2010, 2011. And I, the only thing I've ever heard about that point, about this, you know, that famous preacher out there on the radio, on the Internet, that we all listen to sometimes, 
the first time I ever heard of that guy's name was when he was getting tased by the border by, by the by, by the border patrol. The only time I ever heard of this guy, I didn't know anything about his doctrine, but I was just like, okay, and I started studying it out for myself, and I'm like, wow, this is interesting because I think I'm wrong. And I remember getting up in the pulpit and saying, guys, can, can we? And this is how I introduced it. I said, okay, um, babies don't go to heaven when they die. And they're like, what? I said, prove it to me. Prove it to me otherwise. And we did this on Wednesday nights. Just about 10, 15 minutes, and I made him study their Bible before we started getting any preaching. And I challenged him to search the scriptures. And I come up with some, some off the wall or some crazy, some in your face, some hard to explain or some really unpleasant thoughts to think about. And I would make them search the Bible until they came up with an answer. I said, sure, you can use a concordance. You can use a, sure, you can use a concordance, but no, you cannot use a commentary. Right from the Bible, the concordance is to help us line up words with words. You know, it's a word search. So you can do that. Go ahead. And we went through, and we and I came to this one. I said, okay, I don't, the pre-trib raptures is, a, is not a biblical, I said, okay, I, this is how I did I said, okay, prove to me the pre-trib rapture. Prove it to me. Well, the Bible says he's coming like a thief in the night. That's not proving anything. Well, uh, God's not a wife beater. Not found in scripture, but that's not even a point, so keep on going. You know, go, find it more, find it more. And I was like pointing out, you know, like every point they came up with is kind of realized, wow, maybe I'm wrong. And then I showed them that we're not a point under wrath, and I explained to them what God's wrath was, and I came to that point, like challenged them to read their Bible. I said, if I'm wrong, prove it to me in the next two weeks. And they all went home like a scourge. They went home trying to find it. When I resigned, the next pastor came in, he wrote and said, hey, guys, um, I just want to let you know, uh, I'm post-trib. And they said, so where are we? No problem. Cool. The guy was like, <sighs> Pat Bird, uh, Dexter Taylor was the guy. He came here last year and preached. But he was just like, oh, oh. Well, he resigned. Dexter Taylor resigned. And a new guy came in from Landmark, where I went to college. And Pastor Bull went to college. He came in, gun bla guns a blazing, pre-trib, dispensational. And the church was like, uh-uh. And he's like, whoa, what is this? Get behind the pastor. Get behind the pastor. We're preaching. And he was like having a hard time because the past two pastors preached this thing. And he was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he wound up leaving. But it was just like, whoa, like, hands up. But some pastors are afraid to get up there and preach certain doctrines because, hey, what, what happens to my paycheck? What happens to my church? What happens to my safety net? What do I do? Well, go be a bivocational pastor. Go try it. See how it works. But, um... It takes earthly cares, you know, the food, the lodging, the raiment. Jesus said, take no thought for these things. Look at this, look what it says in verse number um, verse number 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than the more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Isn't your life more than what you eat and what you wear? Yeah, it is. Behold the fowls of the air. He says, are you not much better than that? <sighs> verse number uh, verse number 30. Wherefore, wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye little faith? Take, uh, therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or withal shall, uh, wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these do the things do the Gentiles seek. And if you look at that thing where the Gentiles seek, and you find that phrase in the Bible, what do the Gentiles seek? The Gentiles look for a sign. Or the Jews look for a sign, right? They're always looking for something. They're always looking for another, what, what people are seeking for. They're looking for some recognition. But look down, look at the, how, the, how the passage starts in verse number 24. Now, the passage is far as the paragraph, right? So the paragraph seems to start in verse 24. The paragraph marking says, now by the way, the paragraph marking is not inspired. Can I make that perfectly clear? Verse numbers are not inspired. A man put those in, like in the, in the, in the 12th century, Stephen Langdon or something. He put verses and paragraph forms in there, chapters, paragraphs. But this seems to start a new thought. He says, no man can serve two masters. So I'm either trusting the church to supply my needs, or I'm trusting God. Now I'm going to tell you, as a pastor, I'm, being, I'm going to be trying to be as transparent as I can. 
as a pastor, trying to turn the page to being full-time at the church and not having all my bills stack up and believing that God would supply all my needs and be full-time ministry without taxing the church to death, it's a hard call to make. And when you got a church of our size and it's still small, it's we're not we don't have enough people, we don't have enough income for me to be full-time pastor. Okay? But when that time comes and you're trying to weigh in the balance, do I go full-time or do I go just by vocational? When do I know? When do I have that in there? That's a hard thing. And you'll find that when that takes place, they're not greedy of filthy lucre. Pastors aren't greedy of filthy lucre. They're just trying to weigh in the balance so they don't put their family at jeopardy, yet living by faith. And it's a hard line balance. It's a hard thing to find. It's a hard line to walk. But Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. And whether you like it or not, a pastor, in a sense, when they're having a church of, a, of you know, big enough size, and he's getting paid a good allow, you know, good salary and housing allowance, and he's got some financial liberties. For him to get up in the pulpit and preach a sermon, knowing that he'll lose that safety net, that he'll have to lose and and change the style of living that he's grown accustomed to, in order to make that change, it's easy to serve that master, and that master being the church. It's easy, and while they're they're doing it to serve God. When God says preach it and they don't, it's easy to become a servant to the church, to be a slave to the church, and let the church be your master. It's easy. But in this case, it's talking about our earthly cares, our thoughts for tomorrow. It's easy to do that. Also, there's a there's some people do it for evil reasons. Some people do it for earthly cares. And then there's also those people that serve God for earthly rewards. Quickly, we find, first of all, is seek ye first the kingdom of God in verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's the first thing we seek after is the kingdom of God. Well, what is the kingdom of God? It's the furtherance of the gospel and having God's kingdom advanced. Okay? Having, wanting God's kingdom to be advanced. Well, how is God's kingdom advanced? Through faith. Okay? God's kingdom is only advanced through faith. God's kingdom is not tangible to this world. It's not what we can physically see. Oh, there's God's kingdom here. Oh, there's God's kingdom here. I'm going to move God's kingdom from point A to point B. It's not visible. It's spiritual. And the only currency that's, that is accounted for, that's not counterfeit in this realm of the kingdom of God, in this, in this spiritual thing of the kingdom of God, the only currency that's not counted as counterfeit is faith. Only thing that God will ever accept is faith. Only thing. So the only way we can increase the kingdom of God is through faith, increasing our faith and trusting and depending on him. And that's the eternal rewards, because that's what we're trusting God for. All these things will be added unto you. But hey, you know, the furtherance of the kingdom, the furtherance of the gospel, to get the gospel to the next person, but it's from faith to faith, right? The, the, um, Romans chapter 1, it says, you know, the... the <laughs> this quote... John chapter 10. No, Romans chapter 10. Misfire. For therein is the righteousness of God, is Romans 1. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. From chapter 1, verse 17. Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So seeking first the kingdom of God, and we do these things by faith and for the purpose of building our faith and the faith of those around us. That's why we have church. That's why I that's why I get up and I preach and I want to encourage and increase my faith throughout the week on the, on the subject, but also I want to be able to trans trans um not transform. I want to transpose the faith that God has given me through the week of studying these sermons out, but put them into Ben's life. And I want Ben to take those things and believe it and live it. Say, you know what? It's true. I'm going to live it. And it may not happen immediately, but he starts putting into practice, and Walter goes, man, Ben is just really growing in the Lord. I want to see what he's doing. You start paying attention while he's practicing, and he's putting into practice what's been given to him through faith, and his faith is increasing by other people around him, by the reading the word of God, by the preaching the word of God, 
and I'm going to, and by living the Word of God, I'm, you know, living in faith, I'm going to do that. And then Deborah goes, man, Walter's doing something different. And a man, God's blessing is on Walter. I want to know what Walter's doing. And Walter's like, well, I'm not coming to church. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Walter. But he's just like, okay. And Deborah goes, you know what? I want to do that in my life. And then Deborah, and then, and Deborah puts it in her life. And then Melissa's like, yeah, I need to increase that part of my life too. And Doug's like, thank God, my prayers have been answered. I'm not married to a rebel anymore. And it's like, hey. And then, and then Sarah sees it, and Aaron's like, whoa, revival. She admits that she's wrong every once in a while now. This is great. She's been cooking me dinner. It's great. But I was like, but all these different things go through. It's it's powder. It's it's a protein powder. But it's like going through and adding all these things up. But it's because we see faith being demonstrated in our lives as believers. It's being exemplified through the Word of God as we read it and study it. It's being applied to our life, and then it gets shared to the people around us. It's not just soul winning. Look, I love soul winning, but it's not just soul winning. Soul winning is important, but it's not the only important thing. It's practicing the faith and growing in faith and exercising ourselves in faith. I can't believe he used the E-word, I'm sorry. But he exercised in the faith, right? But also, you see his kingdom advance, but then you also see this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. By his righteousness, it's not just trusting in his righteousness for heaven, but it's trusting in his righteousness that his laws will be intact. And we're going to live ourselves by his laws. If a person believes that God is holy, but does not exercise himself in righteousness, their view of God's holiness is null. Now that was really deep. I'm going to say it again because I don't think I can. If a person's righteousness, if a person's view of God is that God is a holy God, but that does not exercise himself in righteousness by God's laws and by God's standards and God's ways and by right living, we don't have a view of God. How is these people who are Calvinists, oh, God is holy, God is righteous, God is holy, and then they're the first ones out there getting drunk. They're the first ones out there cheating on their spouse. I know of a guy who's a Calvinist. He's out there cheating on his wife. He's out there living up, doing all I'm like... Like something's wrong with your faith. Something's wrong with you. Well, God is holy. God's holy. Yeah, but well, you're not righteous. If we're, if our view of God sees God as righteous, we're, you know, if our, if our view of God sees God as holy, it ought to result in us being righteous and living in God's righteous laws. But also, it's not just about legalism saying, well, God is against it. But what about God's liberties? Yes, there's a whole bunch of things that God says we're not allowed to do. Well, you know what? There's more things saying that God says for us to do. And that God gives us benefits and blessings of. There is liberty within Christ. I like to use this little example. We have a little dog. It's a pain in the butt dog. I don't know what kind of dog it is. It's a mutt. But this thing, Sally. Sally likes to get out and run across the street. You know, she gets out of the house, off a leash, and she just starts to cheese darts. She plays Frogger around cars, not getting run over. But she just takes off and she makes her mark around the neighborhood. And we have to go chase her down. If if the girls if the girls go getting her, go try to chase her before she's done marking, then she goes and then she takes off even further. So today we had an appointment, two appointments before church, and we're trying to get it done. And we left the house early, and Sally Sally got out. Stupid dog. So I had to get the van, go trick her to go for a ride, get in the car, put him back in the house, whatever. But that dog has all the freedom in the world to go anywhere she wants within our yard. Within our yard, she's safe. She won't get by, she won't get hit by a car in our yard. She won't get scooped up by the dog pound in our yard. She won't get beat up by the by the by the neighbor's dog in our yard. In our yard, she is the safest the safest place for her is in our yard. And she has liberty to be in our yard, exactly where she wants to go. She's got enough yard to run back and forth, run around the house, get her exercise, mark territory, she's blue in the face. But it's not good enough. And she's got to go outside of where she's supposed to be and deal in out, you know, within places that are no longer within liberty. Now it's an offense. We have liberty in Christ to do so much within the confines of Christ, but we're not satisfied. 
Because we go off into offenses and sins. We cross the road. We go into things that God says no. We dabble in it. And we want to use it to say, well, we have, hey, diplomatic immunity. <laughs> I'm an ambassador. I've got a diplomatic immunity. I'm a child of the king, diplomatic immunity. No, no, no. God says stay in the confines of the liberties we have in Christ. He said stand fast in the liberty wherewith God has made us free, right? Christ made us free. And be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Galatians chapter 5. Our liberty is in Christ. And how much liberty is there? How much liberty, how much righteousness, and how much right, um, holiness is within Christ that we don't have to dabble in anything else? All the provisions we have are in Jesus. In Him are all the promises, yes and amen. Then why do we dabble into the world? It's because our mind thought is thinking that we have, that Christ is legal, Christ is legalistic, that Christ's grace is legalistic, or that, you know, His laws are legalistic. And I want to expound in grace when it's what it really is is entanglement nobody can live in entanglement and say oh, i wish i had more no one wakes up after 30 years and saying oh i wish i i wish i drank more you know i've been living in my life as a christian separated from the gospel separate from the things of god living according to god's word I, you know at my deathbed i wish i drank more you find the person who's wasted their life in the world and wasted life on substances they get back and they tell their grandkids, oh, you know, I wish I never got in the world. I wish if I, if I could live it all over again and live for God more than I have than, than I have lived. Wow, Grandpa, you live for the Lord. You serve God. And he's like, if I had it, could do it all over again, I would have served God more and not, not in the world so much. But the Bible says sufficient until the evil day thereof. So we know that the evil day, the temptation is always there for us to dabble off, right? Take no thought for tomorrow. Verse 34, don't worry about the stuff. Don't seek after those things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. All these things will be added unto you. we got to seek first Jesus and for his reasons, for, earth, for eternal reasons. And not for earthly, not for uh, earthly reasons and not for evil reasons. Make sure it's for God and God alone. All right, let's take time for prayer. And ask God's blessing on our prayer requests and thanking God for the praises of this past week.